Union. Come Union. When we come to celebrate the Lord's table, we are coming into a, a specific kind of unity. Now, if you're a, if any of you are from the background of Catholicism, you know, the unfortunate, thank God we're not Protestants anymore. We're not protesting anything. God is bringing his church together around Jesus, not around some religious forms or formalities or doctrines that exclude, but coming around the message of the cross and the, the shed blood of Jesus. And I tell you what, if there's anything we need to do in this hour is we need to emphasize the blood of Jesus. Without the blood, there's no power. Without the blood, there's no forgiveness. Without the blood, there's no remission of sins. It is the blood that was shed for us, this precious blood. So the dangerous thing for me is when I get something stir up my heart about uh, the significance of the table today. Now, by the way, I I was thinking about this. This is off the subject here for a moment, but uh, we were at a meeting down in uh, uh, Castle Rock and they did communion and the table of communion they brought out, the communion table itself was the most ornate, beautiful thing I had ever seen. We have this little Dubas area down here, we call it communion table. <laughs> and it's really not at all like the, the, the communion table that was prepared in the ark. Because the communion table that was then at the ark was big enough to hold 12 loaves of unleavened bread, two cups of uh, frankincense, and the table was made of acacia wood and it was uh, covered in gold. And then there was a crown molding around the top to keep the bread from falling off when they had to move the table. So there's all kinds of messages in that as well. But I don't want to get caught up so much in the ornateness, even though that's significant, that we miss the, the main point of what the table was. And so I'm going to read a couple of scriptures from uh, Exodus that kind of uh, sets the stage for where we're going. So remember this, communion is come into union. So, again, I want to backtrack just a little bit and say we are not protesting anything. We are coming together to celebrate something that, uh, and people in the Protestant faith, uh, you know, have often kind of rebelled against the whole idea of some of the practices of other religions. It's stupid because the bottom line is there's far more to this communion table than what we think. It's not a formality. It is something that uh, one person has called it a phenomenological experience. That means that while we don't understand the fullness of all that happens, it represents something of a phenomenon that defies logic, but at the same time is logical. It's powerful that something is released. So this goes back to the Old Testament when the uh, the, uh, uh, tabernacle in the wilderness was put together by the direction of God and they followed it to the T. Every furnishing in it had something to do of displaying God's desire to meet his people face to face. And so it was called the showbread, also known as the table of presence. Exodus 25, 20 say, or 30 rather says, this is where, uh, well, it's used the term, the table of presence, but it was where God and man came face to face. The table itself being made of acacia wood and covered with gold indicates two things. Jesus, the son of man and Jesus, the son of God. So the acacia was that which represented man. And the gold represented the royalty of the Lord Jesus. And that's a very superficial uh, way to put it without going into deep theological dissertation. But mainly the table is about God and man coming face to face. And the bread was always in the presence of the Lord. So I'm going to read this. Exodus 25, verses 23 through 25 says this. Thou shalt make also a table of wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof and the cubit, the breadth thereof and the cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, I don't know what a cubit is, and it's not a little angel. It's a cubit is a measuring thing. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold and make thereunto a crown of gold around it. In other words, a, 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 a little ledge to keep anything from falling off. You shall make it unto a border of a half breadth high, round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof and round about. And verse 30 says this, and thou shalt set the table, you shall set upon, let me say it again, let, you shall set upon that table showbread, and it shall stand before me, be before me forever or always. Now that's important for this reason. The bread always points to Jesus. 
If you remember in John 6, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, and this is when Jesus is talking about uh, the, the bread he's dealing with, the Pharisees and how they resisted everything Jesus was doing. They did not, did not want to believe that he was the son of the living God. And so they were uh, attacking Jesus and his deity. And Jesus said, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who would that be? Feel free to say it out loud. It would be Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus. John 6, 53 through 58 says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, now this is where Jesus ran into troubles because he's talking about the power and reality of this table. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last days. For my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the Father, the living Father, sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. And this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. For he who eats this bread will live forever." We're talking about Jesus. So everything about this table this morning, everything, folks, points to Jesus. Everything. So it was that it sat in the presence of the tabernacle. It wasn't in the inner court. But because it sat out by the altar, and I don't get sidetracked with where the furnishings are. The main thing is that the incense was put on top. The frankincense was put upon two piles of bread, six loaves of bread. All the bread, bread, by the way, was baked. It was made of fine powder ground, powdered flour ground, and it was baked in oven, which always depicts that Jesus was ground or crushed by our sin, and the oven represents that he was uh, in the fire of affliction for our sin. All of this, again, I said it points to Jesus. But the table, like our tables, was a place where we meet. Where we meet together, to fellowship together. So God, even back then, as he's revealing himself to a stubborn people, sets a table, and I'll say more about that in a moment, but that table was an invitation to fellowship, feeding, and friendship, and communion, to be made one with Christ. As we just read, Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. He gives life to the world. He is the bread of life. I started to say that the bread, by the way, was perforated. It had uh, marks in it as it was baked. So there were stripes and it was perforated, indicating that Jesus was wounded and pierced for our sin. How many see that? So if we were doing that with a Jewish celebration... We would have unleavened bread that would have those marks or stripes and we'd see the perforations. And all of those spoke of Jesus when he went to the cross and before he went to the cross, actually. So we see that Jesus is depicted back there. Everything back there in the Old Testament was realized in the new. You can't really fully understand and comprehend the dynamic of what what happened with Jesus without understanding how God from the beginning of time through that Old Testament began to show all the things that he was going to do in Christ as Jesus came on the scene. You can't get the fullest grasp of what the dynamic of Jesus, who, by the way, was the true. By the way, when it says that the bread will sit in the presence of the Lord continually, always, that really is a picture of Jesus. Jesus was always in the presence of the Father. And even in those symbolic things that were happening in the wilderness, uh, in the tabernacle wilderness, the, everything was surrounded by the presence of the Lord. Everything pointed to Jesus, the incense and all that. And by the way, the bread would somehow, if you know anything about incenses and that type of thing, Wendy has these things that she has in the house to you know, just make it smell good. And sometimes it messes up the flavor of my tacos because <clears throat> that stuff kind of permeates. The, you know, so here's the thing. The presence of the Lord so permeated the bread in the Old Testament that was a constant reminder of the active presence of God in the midst of his people. The frankincense always referred to this symbolism 
or the symbolism of the deity of Christ. And by the way, I like the idea that it says it always sits before the presence of the Lord. The bread is always before the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Gary. Always in the presence of the Lord. And by the way, it reminds me of Hebrews 7.25 that says, Wherefore, Jesus, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, uttermost that come unto God by him. That is by Jesus. Seeing that Jesus not only died from the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain from the foundation, he died on the cross, he rose again, but he ever lives to complete everything that he did in interceding on our behalf. Can you see that? Yes. In other words, once you get saved, he continues to keep praying and interceding for you and I to know the presence and the power and the victory of the cross. Aren't you glad for that? He ever lives making intercession for us. So, <clears throat> the bread that we will celebrate in a moment is the presence of God. Represents the presence. But I want to tell you that I don't believe it just represents that. I believe it is this morning, if we will believe it, and stop worrying about correcting bad theology and recognize that Jesus will never ask us to do something just out of cold tradition or formality. That he literally will read a portion of scripture that backs that up in just a moment. But the interesting thing, this presence of God in this table that's spread here is spread for us. And oftentimes you'll go to churches where they say, well, if you're not a member, you can't take of the communion. <laughs> well, we don't believe that. And I tell you why, because this bread, this table, by the way, was shed or set rather for us by God for the forgiveness of sins and for the deal. And folks, in fact, I know of people who came into the presence of the Lord and they were not believers. They, did, they had not accepted Christ. But during communion, they were convicted and they received the Lord that day asking Christ to apply the blood to their life. And they, they were made one with Christ even through the worship of communion. I know that sometimes causes people to think, well, you can't do that unless you're already holy. Listen, we were only made holy by what Jesus did. All right. This is an invitation to come and partake freely. You qualify one way. You come humbly, you come broken, and you come repenting and confessing and believing that Jesus Christ is represented in this broken body. And folks, there's nothing that will bring more unity to the body of Christ than recognizing what Jesus did to bring us all together. Let me just say this one thing. Isaiah 55, with reference to the invitation that God gives today, freely he gives us his grace. He says this, hey, ho, <laughs> is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. And if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat. Listen to me and you will eat what is good and you will enjoy the finest food. We're talking about the table of the Lord. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you and I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples. I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know. And people unknown to you will become or will come running to obey. Because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. In other words, in partaking this table with the Lord, that presence that is always before the Father. Jesus is always before the Father. When we're in his presence, he makes us a new creation and the very power and life of Jesus that is in us begins to flow out from us. And God makes us a witness to the world. Do you see that? Yeah. Come and, the scripture says, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked change to the ways and banish to the very thought of doing wrong. And let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn unto the Lord for he will generously forgive. So it's an invitation to come and freely receive. This morning, the grace that's offered is offered freely. The next thing is the table was a table of unity. It is a place where uh, you all know that scripture in Psalm 133 says, Behold how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Nothing destroys the power of the gospel more than the disunity among God's people. 
arguing and being division about different things that don't have to do with the centrality of Christ will always... Listen, we're never going to come together on unity about doctrine. Look at me, folks. We all have different views or perspectives on doctrine. And by the way, if it isn't found here, it's not legitimate. The Bible is God's uh, owner's handbook. You know, so if you want to know how your life runs best, you go to the owner's handbook. You know. But you see, the table of the Lord that is set before us brings us to a place of unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head, of, uh, head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon and is the dew that descends upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing, even life forevermore. So here's what you have to remember this morning. There is a place of commanded blessing and it comes around the unity of the table. When we're in unity about the purpose and the plan of God around the table of the Lord. Are you with me so far, folks? <clears throat> By the way, Paul really addressed this hard when the New Testament church in Corinth was abusing the privilege of the Lord's table. Because they would come together for these love feasts. Instead of being considerate of one another, they were supposed to be gathering as a family around the table and to celebrate the Eucharist or the Lord's table. But they were come together and some people had a lot of food. They ate and left and some people came with nothing and they left hungry. And Paul said, this is not what this is about. Don't you have homes to eat in? If you're hungry, eat at home. But when you come together, it's about unity to come together and celebrate together at the table. And especially when you come together around the Lord's table. So it is a table of unity. The table must be properly discerned. And this is where it gets really heavy duty this morning. And this is how I hope to bring us to a point of prophetic activity this morning. Paul says this about the table being properly discerned. Now I'm going to say something that's really heavy on my heart today. <clears throat> we have had way too much sickness in this body. And the problem isn't there's something wrong with you. It's the problem is we live in a fallen world. Now, I got COVID right away, you know, right after they gave me the shot for so I'd get it. <laughs> That's a joke. <clears throat> so I'll have a bunch of people write me and go, you're a fool. Well, yeah. So I got really sick right away. And thankfully, the grace of God in your prayers got me out of there. And I probably had it three or four times and didn't know it. So did you. So don't get all pious on me. Uh, not me, you know. Yeah, you. But when I got this last little deal, uh, last Sunday I started getting kind of stoved up and by Monday I was really feeling tough and then Tuesday I could hardly walk. Uh, I did something to my ankle and I was in so much pain and thankfully Pastor Randy was there and he bailed me out and gave me a little break and and I'm waddling, I'm walking home, and uh, or not home, but to my car. And I was in such pain, and uh, went to the, got a hold of the doctor and said, you know, am I am I dying? Do I have creeping jungle rot or leprosy? What do I have? And he said, no, you just probably have a bad sprain, and uh, you know. But I'm sitting in the house, and I said, wait a minute. I believe in Jesus, the healer. But sometimes it's easier to just blow past that so you can suffer and just go, ah, it'll pass. I'm tired of letting things pass. I like to get some instantaneous healing. But I want to tell you, in the meantime, even though I'm not immediately healed, I am standing fast for the healing of Jesus to come to me at every point because I believe it. If I don't believe it, then I should shut my mouth and not ever talk about it. Let me say this little side note. If God didn't want us to be healed either through prayer and the laying of hands or anointing of oil or anything, then why in the world, and I say this, anybody goes, well, I just, you know, we got doctors. Well, if you're going to doctors, just, do, 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 you go to the doctor to get well or just to pay the bill? You go to the doctor to get a prescription just so you can have something else to pay? Or do you go to get well? And if you're going to pray, and you say, well, how's this all tie in? You'll know in a moment. We're going to, when we go to this table, it's going to be a table, we understand, about everything that that table represents. The, the, the Arabians had this statement. They said, to win for the lamb, 
the, the, the reward of his sufferings. Jesus suffered on the cross. But sometimes it's easier for us. I don't know why it is true. It's easier for us to not contend in faith. We allow unbelief to creep in. And unbelief often in the church has become a stronghold because we didn't see immediate results. Or maybe we prayed for years and didn't see the results. And so we discarded that part of our belief system, our doctrine, what the Bible says about Jesus. And gave ourselves to this idea that, well, we're in a fallen world. You're going to get sick. It's one thing to acknowledge that that can happen. It's another thing to give it place that it displaces the grace of God and the promise of the word that the Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, that Jesus bore our sins and our sorrows, our sicknesses and our diseases on the cross that we might be healed. And just because our experience didn't match up with the authenticity of the word doesn't mean that the word was wrong. The word is right. And I will stand on that word. And there are times when I tell you, when I was in the hospital and I couldn't breathe. And I couldn't feel spiritual at all. I felt like a giant beach toad. (laughs) Whatever that looks like. (laughs) But I kept saying, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. And that spirit will redeem or resurrect or quicken my mortal body this thing i'm housed in my real body looks a lot better than this just so you know so this is what paul said in reference to the lord's table i say all that other stuff is free and it's a little dessert on top of everything is that listen jesus wants you whole Jesus wants you healed. And there's a whole segment of people in the body of Christ today who say, well, you know, just, that's questionable. You know, you'll have what you believe. You'll have what you say. Matthew, or, I'm sorry, Mark eleven twenty three. 23. If you believe the word of God, it will not doubt in your heart. You will have whatever you ask for. I know people have used that as a bludgeoning tool, but I'm telling you, the, Jesus said it. And if Jesus said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. Amen. So, Therefore, Paul's saying in the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he says this. In fact, I've got the wrong, but I can do it by heart because I've done it so many times. The same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same manner, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the New Testament blood which is shed for you. Okay. Then he goes on to say, Paul does, goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 11, he says this, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body for this reason. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now, let me say what, what the whole point of this right now is this. Taking of the, t- the table of the Lord unworthily means not realizing its full potential. In other words, letting it just be a formality. Well, this is what we do on the first Sunday of the month. So let's get it over so the pastor can preach the most, one of the 10 best sermons ever preached, and then we go home. And I want to tell you something. This must be the center point of all of our worship as we move forward in the days before the great coming of the Lord. Because we are on the throes in this nation, of the beginning rather, of a great revival that's coming. And I believe the thing that will secure the revival before the coming of the Lord is one author has called it the Great Communion Revival, where we surround ourselves around the authority of the blood of the cross and the power of the cross. And I'll say more as we wrap this up. So what does it mean to drink unworthily or in another worthy manner? And then what about this examining yourself? When I was a kid, I can remember, because <clears throat> I used to talk to my mom about this. You know, you go to communion and all of a sudden you think about all the dirty, rotten things you did all week long. Oh my God. And you know, all the angels are ready right that moment. If you touch that cup, they're going to slam you. <laughs> I'm thinking all the things, the reasons why I shouldn't come to the table. So now I'm in a behavioral modification scene. You know, if I, if I manage my sin problem right, I can take this communion and feel good about it. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying, examine yourself when you come to this table so that you understand that everything that the blood and the bread represents is available to you now in the full potential and power that it was done on the cross so that you can receive the fullness of all that Jesus did and intended for us to have until he returns. In fact, Jesus said when he did this uh, communion with in John 13, he says, you must do this in remembrance and in anticipation of the coming of the Lord. Until you see me come again, you continue to do that. So this cup, this communion table, is also representative of our place in this big word eschatology where it leads up to the very day of the coming of the Lord. We must be faithful to this because this is the only thing that will sustain us before the coming of the Lord. It's the broken body of Jesus, the blood of Christ, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that makes the church equipped for these last days. How many are following what I'm saying this morning? Say amen. Amen. I want to make sure. Listen, not discerning the body. Now, in the middle of the night, I got up and I was feeling really tough last night. So I got up, went out in the, because I I bought some communion elements for home. So I I found a cracker and uh, took my my grape juice out and I'm, I'm, I'm dizzy and I'm not feeling good. So I take the cracker and I eat it and I drink a drink and I said, in fact, before I took a drink, thank God for Welch's. I held it up and said, God, this represents your blood right now. Amen. Put the lid back on, went back and went to sleep. But on, as I laid in bed before I fell asleep, I lifted both hands and I said, God, it's because of the blood. It's because of the broken body of Jesus. I have an everlasting covenant. The sure mercies of David that are secured for me through the blood of his cross. And by his stripes, I am healed. I am healed. I'm going to discern that body no matter what my circumstance tells me. Now, we do live in such a world that some people die because it's, the time when the Lord says there's a time to live and a time to die, you know, that Ecclesiastes passage. But too often, Paul says, many among you are weak and sick among you. Now, I, stand, I sit here today as one who's been sick. So if you're here and you're sick, don't beat up on yourself and don't think, oh, I must be a wretched soul. No, I'm telling you that this morning, I believe that God wants to say to you, by his stripes, you're healed. And when you come to this table... Come in faith, believing that this power that Jesus has back then and now and forever is that he is the healer. And stand on the word of God regardless of your, regardless of your circumstance. Instantaneous healing is great to celebrate, but when you have to persevere in your waiting for the answer, it builds in you the character that says, no matter what I'm experiencing, God's word stands. Yes. Now, one of my favorite things, help me, Lord. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is Psalm 23. Most of us can quote it. That's the problem. Not that we quote it, but that we sometimes can quote it so glibly we don't understand the full potential of what it's saying to us. But I'm always caught by this. I walk, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. By the way, it's the shadow of death. Can, can a shadow hurt you? You ever turn around and fight your shadow? <laughs> you ever heard the term, he's afraid of his own shadow? <laughs> Though I walk through the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for the Lord, you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. By the way, the rod was used for protection. <coughs> the rod represents authority. The staff has to do with support of any kind. The Hebrew word for staff means any kind of support needed. So you have not only the rod that beats back your enemy, the rod of God is seen in Moses' experience. God used to demonstrate a supernatural power to open up the Red Sea. His rod and his staff, they comfort me and support me. And he pounds back my enemies. But I love this verse, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Before <coughs> whatever enemy you are facing right now. This provision of the blood of the cross is 
the provision for whatever the enemy would gather around you to do. Maybe it's an adversity that you're facing, an affliction, a persecution, a temptation, a sickness, a disease, some demonic attack on your life. Three things that Satan loves to do to believers. He loves to condemn and accuse and intimidate. And how many of us are susceptible to those three? I feel condemned because of what I've done. God put us in Christ and Christ in us so that we would not be walking according to behavior, but according to the provision of the righteousness of God imparted by the grace and the whole work of the Holy Spirit in our life to live this life because we cannot live it in our flesh alone. We must have the Spirit of God. Our flesh, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing, for the will is, pre- with, is present with me, but how to perform those things I find not. In other words, we do not have the power in our own nature to do anything. Only the new nature of Christ through the grace of God gives us the power to get over those things of condemnation. How many of you have felt any condemnation this week? Let me see hands. Honest people. How many of you have been accused by the enemy somehow this week? Uh, I saw what you did. You behaved badly. You got in an argument with that person. You call them a donkey, and that's not what they were. <clears throat> so you feel the condemnation or the accusation. And what I think we all deal with, especially if you have any leadership role, is intimidation. All that you're not. Oh, I wish I, wish I, could, I, wish I could be like so-and-so. They're so much more efficient. They're so much better. They're so much smarter. And oh, All that I'm not. You know, I, I, I wish I could be as righteous and holy as so-and-so. Well, guess what? Your righteousness, my righteousness, is not of works that I have done, but the provision of the cross of Jesus. So Jesus deals with all that. So in the presence of my enemies, and it's interesting too, that there can be no Holy Spirit outpouring until first there's the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Jesus spoke of the outpouring of the Spirit in John 7, 38. He said, this he spoke of that river of water that flows out of you. He spoke of the Spirit which was not yet given, for Jesus was not yet glorified. So the outpouring that we experience after the resurrection and the ascension only happened because the blood was shed first. And because the blood is shed, I can come before the throne of God and say, Now, let my cup run over. Anoint my head with precious oil. So that goodness and mercy follows me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the very house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. There's a portion of scripture and we'll see it again around Easter time or resurrection time this year. Uh, and it's just a few weeks away, we're going to be in celebrating the resurrection. But do you remember the story that the, the two on the Emmaus road as they're going to Jerusalem? And they're talking among themselves, and Jesus suddenly ends up kind of merging into traffic with them. And he hears them talking about what has gone on. And, and he says, I hear you talking about these things. What, what things are you talking about? And they go, are you a stranger? You don't know what's going on in the city. Of all the people they could say that to, Jesus definitely knew what was going on. I was the guy hanging on that tree. What do you mean? <laughs> are you a stranger? Don't know what's been going on? And as he walks with them, they start saying, you know, this is one who moved in power and signs and wonders. And we had hoped that this was the Messiah. But then he died, and some of the ladies told us that they saw that he was resurrected, but it seemed like idle tales. And as they walk, Jesus says, oh, foolish doubters, how, how come you didn't believe what the Lord said? And he begins to exhort them from Exodus to the present prophets. And as he's talking about that, Later on, they confess, did not our hearts burn within us while he was opening to us the scriptures? So the the word of God was stirring something in their hearts. Stay with me, folks. The word of God was stirring something in their hearts. They're starting to connect the dots about Jesus. 
And what Moses said and what Isaiah said and what all the prophets said concerning the Messiah. And their hearts are beginning to be warmed with this sense that, oh yeah, you, somehow we missed it. So they stop for a moment to get lunch or to create a little dinner. And Jesus acted as he was going further. And they said, no, 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 please come back. Come back. Let's, let's. So he sat with them. And as he's talking with them about all these things, at the moment where he broke bread with them and handed it to them, suddenly the Bible says, their eyes were opened and they knew it was Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you this morning, as we come to the table, I'm praying just as we sang that old hymn or that old song, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Folks, we have got to see Jesus afresh and new every time we come to this table. Because this that we take always is the presence of the Father. Always God is anointing his servant Jesus, his son Jesus. So folks, as we are in the presence of the Lord today, <clears throat> we are standing in that place to say, the blood will do its work and the covenant of God is secured by the everlasting, everlasting covenant of the blood. And I'm asking this morning for miracles to happen. I'm asking the Lord to do some things. In fact, I, I told the guys this morning, I, wasn't, I think I had a plan how we were going to do this. And now the plan has changed. So I'm going to have the ushers do this this morning. Uh, to pass it out in just a moment, pass out the elements. But I want us to do this together. So, the table of the Lord is also a table of spiritual warfare. And I say that because Revelation gives us a picture of war broke out in the heavens. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. He was cast out, cast down, the old serpent called devil, the Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was cast to the earth and all of his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Hallelujah. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of testimony. They did not love their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth for, and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. But listen, the one thing that has not lost its timing is the everlasting covenant of the blood. Ushers, if you would mind... I wouldn't mind come and take those elements this morning. And uh, Mike, we'll just leave this set. We don't have to move this. But I, I want to end this way. Um, I want everyone to take their portion and hold together because I specifically want to address. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you. Uh, go ahead and begin to distribute now. Everyone hold your portion until you've been served. And because uh, we're going to partake together. And uh, I specifically believe the Lord targeted something this morning. I wonder how many in this room have, ex have been hit with the COVID thing. Let me see how many hands have had, uh, at least you know, at least once you had the COVID thing. Okay. Um, anybody having chronic pain? Let me see your hands. Chronic pain. Anybody who's had, yes. Anybody who's had um, recurring, in your opinion, unnatural reoccurrence of sickness upon you. And you're, you're, you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Let me see your hand. Yeah. I specifically felt the call of the Lord this morning for Chaz and Gina too, because I know um, that in their assignment from the Lord to do what they're doing, the enemy doesn't like it. And I tell you, I believe one of the reasons why I got hit the hardest with this thing was because I had determined that this morning I would not just do a little uh, formality with the Lord's table. And I hope in the future, I probably won't do a whole excursive thing like I've done this morning. But we are going to take more time with the Lord's table than just a little passing swat at it. 
We're going to let it have its full potential. Because in a moment when we all have this together, we're going to do a prophetic act. And I am believing this morning that not only will some be healed here, but the effects of the COVID thing that damaged your body. And we know from science and the doctors say that the COVID virus affected something in us long term. Now, you can say what you want. I'm not an anti-science, but I want to tell you what I am. I am a pro-God. And according to the scriptures, God said to Israel and to Moses, he said, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I put upon the Egyptians. So we have a covenant. And Egypt, because of its hardness against God, experienced plagues. But here's what's interesting. None of the plagues affected Israel. And that last plague, thank you, Pastor. That last plague that happened um, was the firstborn would die had they not taken the blood of the lamb, a lamb for each household that was slain. By the way, this was not a... This wasn't like they went out and went to the market and got a pint of blood. According to the, the tradition, the families had to keep that little lamb in their home for several days. It became almost like a pet. Yep. If you remember the song that Jesus sang one time, it's about um, watch the lamb. The little boy's watching what's going on. They're getting ready to go to temple to worship. He's got his little lamb with him. And at one point, he says to his father, Father, I'm sorry. But the lamb got away. But there was a lamb that did not leave his post. A lamb that did not leave, but went to the cross and did not open his mouth. But was dumb before his slaughterers. Can you see it? This lamb, that was blood was shed for. And I also say this morning, if you're here and you many times said a prayer and asked the Lord in your heart, but you just seem to fall constantly back into old patterns and old ways. I want to say to you this morning, if you'll take this for its full purpose, confessing, repenting and opening your heart to the reality of Jesus. When you partake this this morning by faith, God can touch your heart and change you from the inside out and give you a new heart. You'll be born again by the Spirit of God. It's not in the tradition. It's in the absolute truth of what these things represent. I can't always explain it very well, but I can tell you there's power in the blood of the Lamb.